Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here today and to be able to see again um, so many old and good friends. Um, as you can imagine, this is not an easy lecture to give. Um, so I think I uh, decided to sort of approach it the only way I can actually approach it, which is to sort of tell you a little bit of my own sort of interactions with, uh, with Ricardo. And while I do that, I will try to sort of convey a little bit about him as a person and as a mathematician. Um, that's really um, the only thing that I can actually do. Um, so let me begin first by telling you a little bit about him. Maybe most of you know all of this, but we might as well uh, run through some of this very, very briefly. Um, so he was born in 48 um, here in Montevideo. Um, he began studies in engineering uh, at this very same institution. Um, this was the case of many um, Uruguayan mathematicians. Uh, I guess at the time uh, there was no formal uh, studies just in mathematics and the natural path if you wanted to do math is you will come to the School of Engineering uh, with an eye of doing sort of engineering and then maybe um, switching off and uh, I guess many of us did that. I did, did that myself and then I switched into math um, and I guess uh, that was the case of Ricardo too and many here in this audience I think. Um, so um, he completed his PhD under the guidance of Jacob Pallis in 1973. He made spectacular contributions to um, dy dynamical systems. I think what Enrique said in his lecture is very much true. Um, a lot of his ideas are very much alive and sort of going all over the place. Um, so I think Enrique has told you about only a sort of fraction of the volume of his work. I'm going to tell you um, in due time about an even smaller fraction, somehow the one that I had more contact with. He was invited twice um, to the ICM, which is a sort of remarkable honor. Okay, and he passed away in Montevideo as well in 1995, just a little bit before that uh, meeting that has been mentioned on several occasions during this conference. Uh, that was also a memorable meeting for me, uh, not just because it took place at the bank, as some, a lot of people remember somehow, but because um, it was in some sense a very special meeting. It was a very special moment. Um, and, um, so somehow it really, uh, we sort of put a huge effort to, have, uh, to, to make this happen. Um, Manier had 11 PhD students. Um, some of those uh, names in that list have people that have been particularly important to me. Uh, obviously, the, there is the case of my older brother, Miguel, who unfortunately is not here with us today because there is another conference honoring Ricardo at this very same time in Rio. Um, but this, the, 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 there you can find names like, um, um, like Ever Enrich, who, who I, I hope is, he was around a little bit earlier. Um, he was there, yes. Alvaro Rovella, these are people that are actually uh, taught many of us uh, courses in mathematics. And they are exceptional lecturers. And also, uh, I mean, of course, there you can find, you can find Gonzalo. Uh, that has been a sort of huge influence for me. Right, so um, I'll do maybe a sort of quick trip down memory lane. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit the first time that I actually met Ricardo. So the first thing to say is that I, I do not claim to have known him well at all. So I really got to know him towards the end of his, of his life. Um, but I got some, glimps, some glimpses into his personality and, uh, and of him as a mathematician too. So the first time that, I have, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that we met him was um, in the summer of 1986. So there was a big group of us, uh, I mean, we were about at least 10, maybe Jose Vietes remembers this better than me, at least 10, uh, that we were all essentially shipped from here to Impa somehow. Uh, so this was towards the end of a very difficult period for Uruguay. Uh, the return of many mathematicians um, that were abroad uh, happened maybe one or two years before that. 
And they came and they found a group of um, young people, I guess, who were very keen to learn mathematics. And we were encouraged and uh, essentially told you should all go to Ipmatex and summer courses there. They would be, that would be a very good thing for you. And, and indeed it was. Uh, this was a sort of amazing thing. So I think there was 10 Uruguayans going to IMPA uh, just at the, same, um, at the same time during the summer of 1986. So among them were Vietes, uh, Alba Rubela, and, uh, and my brother Miguel. So how did we actually meet Ricardo? So Ricardo was a difficult catch. I mean, he wouldn't sort of, sort of show up. He wouldn't be at IMPA all the time. He, he was sort of well known that if you wanted to see him, it had to be after two, basically, two in the afternoon. Um, so we managed to catch him in the cafeteria somehow. And then, of course, he was sort of curious. So, so, I mean, uh, um, you know, he wanted to know who, who was coming from Uruguay uh, to sort of take these courses. So I sort of went there with my brother and uh, hello, Ricardo, come from Uruguay, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, you know, he seemed very friendly. And uh, at the time, uh, we were taking a, a, a course on manifolds, a basic course on manifolds. Uh, this was being given by, by El Cides Lins Neto. And we didn't have really much to talk with him, right? I mean, just this was around the time he has proved the stability conjecture. We were sort of little people. He was a big celebrity in some sense. So the only thing we could think of is, uh, why don't we ask him, you know, this very difficult problem that we cannot solve <laughs> from the course, and we did. Um, and he actually dispatched the problem more or less immediately um, after a coffee, a Coke, and a cigarette. And then we sort of went away. So that was my sort of uh, first encounter with, with Ricardo. Uh, so that was actually a, a memorable summer at Impa. A few months um, later, uh, he came to Montevideo and gave an unforgettable lecture um, here um, at the IMRA. So once again, I guess, I mean, my, my uh, uh, it, it probably he wasn't coming that often before 85, essentially. It was essentially uh, when Jorge Lebovitz returned to the country that we started to see more of Ricardo, essentially. So he came and he gave this uh, incredible lecture on geodesic flows. I really don't know why he picked that topic. He could have talked about the stability conjecture. He had lots of possible um, topics to talk about, but he decided to talk about geodesic flows. Uh, this was a couple of years after his work with Freire on manifolds without conjugate points. So this is a kind of well-known theorem telling you that if you have a geodesic flow on a manifold without conjugate points, then um, the uh, topological entropy coincides with the volume entropy that was defined by Francois earlier um, in, the lecture, in, um, in the meeting today. And he had, um, just around that time, a few years earlier, given a new proof uh, of a very famous theorem by Klingenberg that um, said that uh, if you have an anos of geodesic flow, then you didn't have conjugate points. So conjugate points, just briefly, is if you go to the universal cover, two points are joined by a unique geodesic. So if you have a manifold with ne negative curvature, this is obvious. But if you just assume an Ossov, this is actually non-trivial. It's a non-trivial fact. So the proof by Klingenberg was a proof using the Morse theory of the loop space. Ricardo gave a completely uh, new proof. And he had this sort of way of looking at the geodesic flows that we were fascinated with. At least I was. I mean. Um, uh, my first contact with the geodesic flow was essentially through Jorge Lebovitz. Um, Jorge had his own way of looking at things, uh, but somehow seeing Ricardo lecture was unforgettable. I mean, it was not just the quality of what he was talking about, it was the quality of the delivery, right? I mean, um, you saw just a glimpse a little bit on the video how good he was at, at sort of explaining things. So his lectures were really sort of impeccable. Um, so I guess those who uh, have visited uh, the Institute here of Mathematics know very well of the informal gatherings um, on the corridor, right? So I, uh, um, the seminar will always start late. I mean, you, you, you could not expect that it will start on time. They will have sort of, you know, will start time X. It will never start at time X. It will be sort of at least 30 minutes later. Um, so here's a, so, so I went yesterday and took a picture of the corridor because I think I have this sort of uh, wonderful memories of it. It looks a little different. I mean, in some sense, it looks a little different today than what it did maybe um, 20 plus years ago. Uh, 
it looks a lot cleaner to begin with. Um, but the seminar would take place in that room, and then people will come out and sort of gather there, you know, classes of people, and there will be conversations about more or less anything. The conversations will sort of move from sort of politics to football to mathematics. Um, when Ricardo um, gave this seminar, he sort of came, sort of sat there on the corridor, and we started chatting. So this was actually my first memory of a sort of kind of proper conversation with him in which I got a glimpse uh, of his um, refined and lethal sense of humor. Um, so his sense of humor was uh, um, something that you had to be uh, very careful um, about. And it's very difficult for me not to talk about Ricardo without uh, mentioning Jorge. Um, so I think when, when I sort of exchange emails with Enrique uh, a few days ago, he sent me some slides that contain that picture. I haven't seen that picture before. I don't know if any of you has, had, had seen it. I see Martin nodding. Um, I, I've never seen a picture before of Ricardo and Jorge together. And this is, a, I think, I think it, this is a great one. Okay, so uh, as I said, I never really uh, got to know Ricardo that well. Um, so I left in 87 for my PhD, and my further interactions with him were essentially in the sort of period 91, 94, um, after I finished my PhD, and I was sort of more or less like uh, uh, many people after finish the PhD without really knowing what to do and uh, looking for a direction, looking for a bit of a future, and somehow um, things happened in such a way um, that I was sort of able to sort of interact with him. Uh, but this was also a particular difficult moment for him in which he, he was already uh, suffering very much uh, with his disease. Um, during this period, I, have, I mean, we sort of visited him with, with Miguel in his, his flat here in Montevideo. Um, we had some sort of wonderful discussions. And I think one thing that I really wanted to, 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 uh, to say was that there was um, uh, some sort of, sort of incredible moments, even during his weakest moments, you could see actually him switching the topic of the conversation to something that would be of interest to us. I mean, that was a sort of um, quite amazing. Okay, so uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit then now about my own personal mathematical journey next to the ideas of Ricardo, a little bit. Okay, so uh, I will be touching upon um, his work on Lagrangian systems. So I, I will tell you a little bit about that. Um, so in this slide, I will just simply mention the three main papers that he published on that. So the first two were actually published in non-linearity. Um, one actually, I mean, the, the, the preprint was uh, ready for many years, but it was published um, one year after he passed away. And then the third one, which is the one that I will really will talk about the most, uh, was a paper that he actually n never completed. So he wrote the paper, and he wrote, I mean, a, a, a series of, um, of theorems and uh, wonderful conjectures, too, I think. And the proofs were actually given um, quite a few years later by Gonzalo, <coughs> by Delgado, another of um, his former PhD students, and by Renato Iturriaga, which I guess he must be also attending the other conference uh, in Rio at the moment. Um, so the paper was actually published twice. Um, so it was published as a conference proceedings, I think edited by Francois here in the audience as well, going back to that conference in 1995. And then it was reprinted a couple of years later in the Bulletin of the Brazilian Mass Society with a follow-up of the proofs uh, by Gonzalo Renato and uh, Jorge Delgado. So it's really on that sort of third paper that I would like to tell you a little bit about some of the ideas. So the first thing to say just before I go to the next slide is that again, there is a sort of very, I mean, in some sense, a very kind of clear connection with the School of Engineering too. So I mean, um, so back when I was taking my courses at the School of Engineering, in the, uh, at the School of Engineering, there were these incredible courses on mechanics. Yeah, I mean, there was mechanics one, mechanics two, 
And these were actually fantastic, particularly because on Lagrangian mechanics. Um, I, I did have conversations about these courses with Ricardo too, who found it actually very difficult. I mean, it was uh, pretty tough somehow. And you could say that in some sense, the work that he's done, you know, you could sort of trace a very continuous line from those courses immediately uh, into his work on Lagrangian systems. Uh, and we'll try to sort of make a case for that in a minute. So I will mo mostly focus on this third paper. And this is really an attempt to understand the, the dynamics on the various energy levels using variational methods. Yeah? So I guess something that we are all very familiar with. At some point, we must have, you know, uh, and I will go through that very quickly. Um, the solutions of the oil uh, Lagrange equation, the oil Lagrange equations come essentially from a variation principle. Um, and I think to sort of get into the theory, um, I will tell you right away the class of Lagrangians um, that Ricardo was discussing. Uh, so we'll not do it in the most general form. So for those of you that went to Gonzalo's lecture yesterday, there is a more general framework for this. You can take a convex superlinear Lagrangian, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the, the theory is already, and in some sense, is already a theory about that class of Lagrangians, uh, which in some sense are the most classical Lagrangians from classical mechanics. So you put kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy comes in the form of a Riemannian metric. You have a potential, U of x, but then you also have a magnetic potential that comes um, on the way of a one-form theta. So um, in the velocities, so if you look about the, if you fix a point, so x is a point on the manifold, and v is just a tangent vector, um, if you fix the point x, this is just a polynomial of degree 2 in the, in the velocities, uh, where for high v's, the metric dominates, uh, but for small v's, the one form starts sort of getting into the way and produces some effects in the magnetic field. And this will come up, will come up in a minute. So that system L, as you know, um, I guess uh, I learn here this School of Engineering has a first integral of motion, which is the energy, which is just the kinetic energy plus the potential. Um, that's a first integral of the system. So I wrote it in the most classical way because I could not resist switching to QQ dot. Um, because, <laughs> um, as I guess, a few days before coming to the lecture, Martin told me this is a, le this is a lecture potentially for a general audience. Uh, so I, I thought if I change the XV to QQ dot, I would be able to get away with it. Um, and then I changed the theta to A, because that's a physically uh, relevant way you're writing it for the magnetic potential. So that's the Lagrangian. Um, so the action of a curve uh, that actually Gonzalo told us about yesterday is just the integral of the Lagrangian. That's the action of, a, of an any given curve. And if you, look at the, if you look at the critical points of that, you, you, you know, you do gamma s and you differentiate with respect to s and you just differentiate, uh, the Euler equations, um, the Euler Lagrange equations sort of pop up. Uh, wonderful second order um, ODEs. Somehow they produce a dynamical system on the tangent bundle of the manifold. So the phase space now is uh, positions and velocities, is the space of all q, q dots. And the function E, which is um, defined on TM, is now a first integral. This is actually, if you're working on a bounded space, on a compact space, then this flow is defined for all times T, uh, becomes a complete flow. And, um, and this is really the dynamical object of study. Now, there's a sort of bit of geometry coming up that will be relevant in a, in a couple of minutes uh, that is, again, very, very classical. Um, so perhaps for this one, I might as well draw a little picture. So the geometry of those en energy levels depends on the value, on the amount of energy you have, unsurprisingly. So if your energy is sort of very high, then the energy levels will project onto the entire thing. But if you don't have enough energy, uh, the energy levels might not project over anything, uh, over everything, and there is this sort of threshold value, E0, which is the same as the maximum of the potential. And uh, if you have energy more than E0, then you will project over everything. And if you don't, you will not. So I don't know if your uh, money for M is just some sort of 
if you like, some surface of Harry genus. So remember sort of TM, you're looking at positions and velocities. So uh, if your energy is less than E0, it could very well be that the projection of this is some sort of a subset of N that doesn't cover everything. So the particles will sort of go, but then will reach that sort of boundary with velocity zero, essentially, and then go back in. Uh, I will show you one very dramatic example of this, where the particles, you, you, you don't have enough energy, and then the particles do not hit the entire uh, configuration space. OK, so let's keep that particular special value in mind, because there will be now several values, special values coming up associated with Ricardo's paper. OK, so here's a dramatic example. This is my favorite pendulum. Um, I don't know if you ever have came across this one. So um, this is called the Botafumeiro. Uh, it's a pendulum. OK, so, so you, have to, um, you have to be considered here and sort of imagine that that rope is not bending. And it's a sort of rigid rope. But uh, let's assume that for the moment. Um, have you ever come across this, this pendulum? Ah, OK, so this is the, 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 the story is very interesting. So um, this is in Galicia. Um, and uh, the sort of idea is that you, know, you, you, you want to burn some incense, and you want to distribute the incense all along the cathedral. right? Um, so you have many approaches for this. You can burn many small little things of incense. Or you could have this amazing idea that the Galicians had which is to sort of create this um, huge container with incense, hang it as a pendulum from the middle of this incredible cathedral, and then make it swing in this sort of very dramatic fashion. Uh, so then uh, the whole church and the audience will be engulfed in this incense cloud. Um, OK, so uh, <laughs> this, is, this is amazing, right? Uh, uh, so, so the uh, system of pulleys is from 1604, and they managed to push this thing this to velocities reaching you know, almost 68 kilometers per hour inside this very valuable cathedral. Um, so that's a pendulum. Now, uh, fortunately, that pendulum never reaches the entire phase space. The entire, this is a, a spherical pendulum. The entire phase space would have been the entire two sphere. And the Galician engineers have designed that so that that will not happen. So people will be, will be safe. Um, so that's an example where you, don't, where you don't have enough energy, fortunately, to sort of hit the entire phase space. Um, you know, one idea that they haven't implemented yet, that if you really want to make it like the sort of Lagrangian system that I had before, so this would be purely kinetic energy plus potential. But you can imagine the sort of engineering putting some charge on that and then putting huge magnets on the walls of the cathedral, and then it will be a perfect uh, system fitting the theory, um, <laughs> as I wrote it before. OK. So um, that fortunately has energy less than E0, so the cathedrals and the visitors are supposed to be fairly safe um, in principle. OK. So uh, how did Ricardo go into this Lagrangian system? So, um, so I think. Part of the story begins actually with a paper by John Mather uh, from 1991, uh, who wrote a foundational uh, paper on the subject. Uh, so there is a paper and there is a title, uh, and I think and I think that paper had um, a very strong influence on Ricardo actually. So he actually uh, came across that paper way before the paper was published and kind of decided to work on this somehow. I mean, I, the, the, there may be other reasons that I know about, but I know that this paper was uh, a huge influence on actually Ricardo doing some work on these Lagrangian systems. So John Mather uh, was trying to sort of essentially generalize his theory of twist maps on cylinders to high dimensions. Um, and his model for high dimensional twist maps were exactly these Lagrangian systems, except, and it has to be said, that in, math, in Mathers, John Mathers' case, he was looking at time-dependent periodic Lagrangians. So, so they were not autonomous systems, as the ones that I have been describing, but they had a, a dependence on time. So the main idea in that paper by John Mathers is essentially to replace curves 
by measures. And then, rather than trying to minimize over curves, you try to really minimize over measures, basically. And then you would hope that the minimizing measures will be special, and they will be giving you information about the dynamics of your system. This is essentially the, 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 the main idea. Um, so the action of a measure uh, was also defined in the lecture by Gonzalo, but I remind you briefly, you have a Borel probability measure on the tangent bundle, you just integrate L with respect to the measure mu. Now, in my view, Ricardo managed to bring uh, this theory of John Mather to a completely new level with a completely new set of insights, particularly in the autonomous case. I think he sort of picked up quite a few things um, that hadn't, be, hadn't been picked up by John Mather, mainly because I think Mather was actually interested in different things. I mean, my, if my understanding of this is correct, Mather always had an eye towards proving unknown diffusion and always saw this theory as a mechanism for constructing this orbit sort of going off to infinity, basically, in the time-dependent case. Um, so this was an, an exciting time since, uh, more or less uh, independently, Albert Fatih was actually developing his weak KEM theorem. So there was a lot of somehow going on uh, at the time, uh, actually, Ricardo was working on this paper of his. So the paper of Ricardo has this great idea about these threshold values, these critical values, which nowadays um, they are being named in honor of Ricardo. They are called the Manier critical values. And uh, I will tell you about um, a few of them. Again, they were defined in the lecture by Gonzalo earlier, but I will remind you of the definition. It's a very simple idea somehow, uh, based sort of on the following fact. Um, the Lagrangians that I wrote down have this very special form, right? There's sort of kinetic energy plus something linear plus a potential. So for each x fix, you can imagine these things, they're just sort of, sort of parabolas, basically. You can think of them, right? So they will have a minimum at every point, yeah? So if you pick your k large enough, the L plus k will, will, will be positive, yeah? So if you take your k very large, L plus k will be positive, and then the action of any closed curve will be positive. So then the idea of this critical value is really very simple. It's to say, well, let's try to decrease this value of k until somehow I kind of manage to find somewhere a closed curve that has negative action. Or you can go the other way. I, the way this is defined, uh, I, I, I sort of said it's defined by the infimum, but uh, you can also do it the other way around coming from, uh, from the bottom. So he just introduced in the paper this critical value. And it turned out that this critical value had all sorts of connections with Mather's um, theory. So one of the first theorems that is actually stated in that, um, in that paper of Ricardo is a characterization of this very simple threshold value at C of L in terms of this sort of uh, minimize, uh, sort of invariant measures or the action of these measures. So he proved that another way by which you can recapture um, this critical value is as minus the minimum of the action of the Lagrangian running over all the invariant measures of the Euler Lagrange flow. And you can actually check, it's easy to check from the definition, that this critical value C of L is greater or equal than this value E naught that I defined before, that has the property that the energy levels project over everything. It's again very easy to check. Now, how does this connect with actually Mather's theory? Well, um, I can explain that sort of quickly. Uh, the theory has gauges, naturally. Um, what are these gauges? Well, if you pick a close one form, you can consider a new Lagrangian, which is uh, L plus omega or L minus omega. This would be exactly the same kind, right? If you're just simply changing the one form by adding another close form. But of course, if you, if you think a little bit about it, if you add a closed form, you don't change the actual magnetic field. You're just changing the potential, but not the magnetic field. So if you don't change the magnetic field, the particle, the Euler Lagrange flow is just the same. Yeah? You will have a slightly different Lagrangian, but the orbits will be exactly the same. Even better, uh, when you change the, um, the Lagrangian by a closed one form, it really only depends um, the, if you're looking in particular at these sort of you know, actions of invariant measures and so on, or the critical value, it really only depends on the class of the form. 
because if you were to change um, if you were to change the closed one form by another, let's say df, when you integrate that df along a closed to orbit, you get you get you get zero. Yeah? So the what is really relevant of the closed one form is just the class of the form, not the actual closed one form. So this immediately gives somehow a function uh, on cohomology on the first Ram cohomology group. Uh, so if you define a, f a function alpha of omega as this sort of critical value of L minus omega, this gives you now a perfectly defined function from H1 into R. And it turns out that the previous theorem actually tells you that this is exactly uh, Mathers alpha function that plays is the key function that appears in the paper by Mathers. Mathers paper is about all these sort of alpha and beta functions. So there's one in cohomology, another in homology. But somehow this definition of the critical value was capturing kind of immediately um, this um, Mathers alpha function. So that was Ricardo's first theorem. There were many theorems in that paper, but somehow also if you have that um, function on the cohomology classes, and the theory has all these gauges, um, one thing that you can actually show, which is you know, not so hard to believe, is that the, some of the sort of convexity of the Lagrangian is inherited by this uh, alpha function. And this function alpha becomes also convex and superlinear, growing faster than linear. So therefore, it has a unique minimum. So um, what Ricardo did in his paper is, say, oh, well, this, uh, this is a special thing somehow. I mean, this critical value somehow doesn't depend on the gauges. And you're sort of picking up one really now distinguished value associated to the system somehow. So he defined the strict critical value as C0 of L precisely as the minimum of this, um, of this um, uh, critical values of L minus omega. And this is very special. It has turned out to have connections with symplectic topology. So there's a sort of wonderful kind of universe associated with this critical value, which Manier was immediately sensing. I mean, he was sort of picked up various other things. But I guess probably at that time, he didn't pick up actually the depth of this, um, of this critical value. Uh, but what he did pick up, and this he sort of mentioned immediately, is that all these measures that were popping up in Mathers' paper, all these measures have to have high energy somehow. I mean, uh, so I remember uh, Actually, Ricardo saying, you know, yeah, and this, you know, what comes out of this is that all these measures by math have to have energy, high energy, energy at least is zero or higher. Something that was actually picked up by Diaz Carneiro early on, somehow, that these math measures had a kind of special property related to the energy in the autonomous case. So then Ricardo had a question sort of tailored particularly for my brother and myself. So in one of the sort of visits that we made to his house, uh, he, he, he told us, well, he has a question for you, too. Um, so he said, so, uh, so I think that this is very likely to be true. So if you have one of these energy levels in a Lagrangian system that is hyperbolic, that is an also in the sense that Enrique was telling us a little bit earlier, it should have high energy. And I'll tell you in a minute why he was actually making that, uh, that sort of conjecture. I mean, so he asked that, that uh, question, so we went away sort of thinking, I mean, this is a Great, right? I mean, it's a new problem straight from the master, uh, particularly tailored for us. So we, we, we got pretty excited somehow. You know, we, we, we had something that uh, kind of nice that we could work on. Um, so um, just before I tell you what it is, so in some sense, somehow the, the, the rest of the talk is a resolution to, to that question of Ricardo, I think. So. Um, so before I get into that, I have to tell you a little bit about that there are actually many critical values. I mean, this has, so um, this is a critical value C of L. Then you can change the L by L minus omega because of this gauge. Then there is a minimum of that. But then there are other things that you can do which are completely natural. Um, so with Miguel, we started to look at coverings. And we said, well, uh, why not? I mean, this is a you know, completely natural thing to do. If you take just a covering of your manifold, you can lift a Lagrangian. And then if you look at the definition of a critical value, you can define that the critical value on that covering. Completely natural thing to do. That value would be defined. And then the natural question was, you know, how these values were changing with the coverings. And then you could sort of very easy check that 
um, these critical values were insensitive on the finite covers, but they were going down as you were going up in covers. Yeah. So uh, you can naturally associate now two more critical values in terms of coverings, because you know, okay, so they are, if you have a manifold, you have all kinds of coverings, of course, but there are, let's say, two distinguished ones. There's a universal cover uh, that we all know, I guess. Uh, but there's also another kind of pretty well-known co uh, covering, uh, which is the sort of abelian cover, um, essentially given topologically by the kernel of the Hurewitz map from pi 1 into h1. So naturally, you, since the universal cover covers everything, that's the smallest of the critical value, but there was this other one from the abelian cover. And all these critical values are somehow always greater than or equal than um, the critical values that the Botafumeiro never reaches. Yeah, that's important to keep in mind. So um, the resolution to Ricardo's question uh, came in several um, stages. Unfortunately, this was you know, a couple of years after Ricardo <coughs> passed away. So with Miguel, we first proved that this st uh, strict critical value that Ricardo had defined was quite naturally the same as the critical value of the Villian cover. Oops. Uh, but we managed to produce examples that somehow were giving a negative answer to Ricardo's question, to produce an example of an annonce of energy level uh, with energy in between the critical value of the universal cover and the critical value of the Villian cover. And then, um, one or two years after, we somehow actually got the right uh, theorem. So, if the energy level is an also, then actually there is something going on exactly as Ricardo suggested. Uh, he just didn't quite get the right critical value. But, I mean, this is a really kind of minor thing in a way. Um, so, this is the universal, um, this is a critical value of the universal covering, the one that has to, that works for, for hyperbolicity. And then when Albert Fatih saw this, he kind of immediately realized that there was a kind of you know, group theoretic reason for this to happen. This and also of energy levels happens of surfaces of higher genus, in which the, uh, of course, the fundamental group is not amenable. I mean, um, so somehow uh, this sort of gap between the universal cover and the abelian cover only happens uh, when the pi one is not amenable. Um, a lot of this theory was actually being done on tori, and of course on tori, these two critical values are always the same. So that was a sort of the, the, the answer to the question. Um, so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about why somehow uh, Ricardo asked the question in the first place. And this goes back to the um, theorem of Klingenberg and, and his sort of new proof of Klingenberg's there. So the key ingredient somehow to, to produce this sort of phenomenon that the energy of an of energy, the, the energy of an also level has to be sufficiently high comes, is at the heart of all this is this Klingenberg theorem somehow. And it's something that I will tell you to you in a minute that which again I picked up from Ricardo and I have never forgotten somehow. This is like the essential thing uh, that one has to look at. So the great theorem of Ricardo is the following. So it says that if a geodesic flow admits a continuous invariant Lagrangian subbundle, then the subbundle is transversal to the vertical subbundle. So let me just explain a little bit about this. So if you have an also geodesic flow, you have the stable and unstable bundles. And in the case of the geodesic flow, it's very easy to check that the unstable and unstable bundles are actually Lagrangian. So uh, in other words, this sort of symplectic form in phase space has to vanish on this subspace. And it's very easy to see because this two form is invariant. So you just pick you know, a couple of vectors in the stable subspace. You let t go to infinity, and that goes to 0. So the form has to be zero on any pair of vectors. So they have to be Lagrangian. Um, so, uh, and in the of case, of course, they are just continuous. So what Ricardo did was he sort of realized that somehow the only thing that actually mattered there in the closed case was not the hyperbolicity, but just having these continuous invariant Lagrangians and bundles. And then the key property in Klingenberg's theorem was the transversality of these subbundles with the vertical subbundle. The vertical subbundle is just um, the kernel of the projection map. So it's essentially you stand on a point and it's just a fiber over the point. 
So the, 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 uh, the key geometrical property that um, a geodesic and an also geodesic flow has is that this is stable and unstable bundles have to be transverse to the vertical. And I remember Ricardo clearly saying, you forget about non-conjugate points. This is really the property. Everything comes out of this. So once you prove this transversality of the stable bundle with the vertical, then the rest comes from Sturm comparison, ODE standard thing. This is the key property. And he gave a wonderful proof of this um, using using the Maslow index. So he gave a kind of a very cool proof uh, using the Maslow index and the Maslow cycle. Now his proof um, used the fact that the geodesic flow was reversible. So time reversible means that if you, know, if you go along um, the orbit and then if you reverse time you can come back also along an orbit. So this will happen for any classical system of the form kinetic energy plus potential, but if you put a magnetic field, the reversibility gets destroyed, yeah? Because the magnetic field twists kind of always in one, in one direction. So you go, if you come one way, and then if you change time, you come in a different orbit. So it's not reversible. So Ricardo wanted to know, I mean, um, um, and this was, sort of, this was sort of with the clock going back a little bit in time, uh, sort of 91, wanted to know, well, I mean, there had to be a Klingenberg theorem for this more general class of Hamiltonians, uh, where my proof using the reversibility is replaced by something else. And this, uh, this was another question that he posed earlier to Miguel and myself. Um, and when I sort of go back, uh, when I came back from my, from my PhD, um, that I came straight back here to Uruguay, uh, my first project with Miguel was actually to look into this, come up with a new proof of this that didn't use the reversibility. And, um, and I think this is perhaps, maybe this is the kind of key point of the lecture, I guess, today. Um, this was a wonderful moment. Uh, I will tell you in a, in a few minutes why. Uh, we came up with this proof. This was a proof that we gave. It was published in 84, but somehow we started working on this um, in 91, uh, a paper that I'm very happy with. And somehow, uh, I do have wonderful memories of discussing um, this paper with Ricardo and Miguel. And Ricardo helped us a lot with the writing. Somehow he, he, he kind of liked the, uh, the sort of idea, he liked the project, and then, you know, there we, we, we felt his sense of humor, as I will try to show you in a minute, his lethal sense of humor more than once. Um, he volunteered at some point, I'll write introduction for you, and then I'll kind of show you how to do it. Um, uh, he did it, and it was actually way much better than the ones we, uh, the one we wrote. Um, and uh, so there's a sort of, I did check this with Miguel, because, um, so at some point in the paper, um, you know, the sort of emails going back and forth, this was the early days of email, uh, and at some point, you know, we, we needed to deal with the Maslow cycle, which is, you know, not, 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 not quite a manifold, but it behaves as if it were a manifold, right? I mean, it um, has some singularities, uh, it's, a li it's uh, stratified, but the bad part has could mentioned three, so it almost works as if it were a manifold, but, you know, we needed the, to get the technology right. So at some point, you know, we needed to give the right reference, and we ins sort of inserted a phrase in the paper, you know, saying that this is a, you know, uh, this was a stratified cycle in the sense of Whitney or something like that. And then Ricardo came back with it. With the, following, uh, with the following comment, I thought it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I, did check, I did check with Miguel, and this is, uh, I, this is, yes, yes, no, 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 he said that, yes, he did. <laughs> so, um, so I went back, I read the paper again, it didn't look too bad. <laughs> I went to listen to the uh, to the symphony again, the fourth move, the fourth movement. It's not pedantic; it's majestic, actually. I mean, <laughs> which I'm not saying that the introduction of a phrase is majestic in any form, but uh, but but again, it depicts Ricardo in some sense at his best. I mean, his, his sort of sense of humor was sort of spectacular. He was very fond of music too. Somehow, he was really incredibly knowledgeable. You could sort of switch the conversation very quickly from mathematics to music. Uh, he will do that uh, more properly with my older brother, who is uh, much more knowledgeable than me in classical music. Uh, but that was sort of wonderful, wonderful to see. And there were many sort of exchanges of this sort of nature, somehow kind of private ones that, are, um, that they were really very good. So the, the um, actually, just before I go into this, 
this is uh, something else that did impress me. I mean, his command of English was remarkable. I mean, we, we, we actually saw it in, in the video, how well he could explain. Uh, uh, um, so he, 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 he read huge amounts. So, so he was some sort of Anglophile in some sense. And uh, his knowledge of the English and sort of American literature was extensive and deep, I mean, which was actually quite remarkable too. So he was, he was different, really, um, in many levels. Uh, the, the, the transversality of a stable and unstable bundle with B already forces the energy to be bigger than A0. And this was actually, in some sense, our first observation that we told Ricardo, oh, uh, if you, since we have this new proof, proving the transversality of a stable and unstable bundle, this is actually telling you that the energy has to be high enough. You cannot have an of energy level that will produce a sort of Hills region like that. And the Ricardo said, oh, really? Yes, you can't. And he, he really liked that sort of observation somehow. He said, oh, I thought if you sort of, you know, put a system there with enough balls bouncing against each other, like those sort of systems in mechanics that we saw at the School of Engineering, that one of those had to be an Ossov. Uh, no, it can't. It can't because the, uh, once you hit the boundary, the vertical vector field kind of becomes vertical. And if you are looking at the transversality, if you, if you prove the transversality of the weak stable bundles with the vertical, you violate exactly that if you had a, something that projects, uh, that didn't project over anything. Um, so that kind of made not just our day, but our ears to come in some sense. You know, the fact that Ricardo found this uh, interesting made, it, uh, made us incredibly happy. And now you can see why he asked us that question early on. Uh, so once he came up with these critical values and these critical values were bigger than E0, then he said, oh, I have, I have a question special for you too. Yeah? So why don't you now try to prove that this an of energy level has energy even higher somehow, which is higher than these sort of thresholds given by the critical value. So that was the, the um, uh, story there. So this was, uh, really made us very happy for a long, it makes me. Happy you in today. Okay, so so to get the stronger property that k is bigger than cu, uh, one has to combine the transversality of the weak bundles with a topological argument, and somehow use a little bit more, and then once you know that these are actually Lagrangians, you go to the universal covering, and then the whole proof kind of unfolds. And this was somehow what we did later on with Gonzalo, with Renato, and Miguel. Okay, and this is enough to give K bigger than CU. Um, just before I finish, as I think I have just one or two slides more quickly, and I will be over. There is still an open problem here, which is actually quite interesting. Uh, uh, we still don't know, and this is kind of natural now in the context of Klingenberg's theorem, whether um, every energy level, K less than Cu, um, have conjugate points. Right, so I think I will finish just with two slides, uh, because I think it's sort of quite, I feel quite fitting uh, to finish with this for reasons that you will see in a minute. So um, Ricardo had a, did a lot of work on, the, uh, on these Lagrangian systems uh, from the genericity point of view, and he introduced the right notion of genericity, which is um, perturbing, and this is complete, I hope it's completely natural by now at this point, perturbing just with potentials, functions that depend only on the point, on the point x, because if you do that, you will not leave the class. And he proved an exceptional theorem in this direction, uh, again, it was published in 86, but it was proved quite early on. Gonzalo mentioned this uh, theorem a little bit earlier, uh, in, uh, mentioned his, uh, this theorem in his lecture, and he said that uh, there is a generic set such that um, if you have a potential in that generic set, then the Lagrangian L plus phi has actually a unique minimizing measure, and in addition, that unique minimizing measure is uniquely ergodic. So, his view was that somehow, if you were allowing for genericity properties, you could make all this theory, all this sort of math theory, very, very sharp, and you would sort of start kind of getting a, getting a very, very clear picture of what was going on. And in fact, he conjectured, and this was a um, wonderful conjecture in, in that one of those papers, um, that 
for every Lagrangian, uh, you can uh, find a generic set such that uh, that unique minimizing measure is actually supported in a periodic orbit. And when I say periodic orbit, I mean periodic orbit and sort of equilibrium point, as in Gonzalo's lecture. And again, uh, I guess I'm putting the most expensive conjecture there because it's free uh, at this point, I guess, <laughs> as Gonzalo uh, said. So it was also known um, from quite a few years ago that the unique minimizing measure, if it is supported in a periodic orbit, then generically the orbit will be hyperbolic. I think it, the Gonzalo and Renato did that with these sort of canal sort of perturbations that Gonzalo explained in his lecture. And I think I would like to finish and leave you with this, which I think is a very fitting finale, uh, to see one of um, Ricardo's PhD students, uh, uh, after decades of uh, spectacular work, proving his conjecture uh, for surfaces in the C2 topology. Thank you.